Hi everyone, uh, I had totally forgotten that there were some questions waiting to be answered and I thought uh, today I'll do it. So a um, few parents asked me these questions leading to tennis. The first one is what is the difference between a top 20 player and other players? Is it their talent, training, fitness, mental abilities? Hmm, it's a great question. Talent, training, fitness, mental abilities, it's the combination of all of these. I think the top 20 players are better in all of these than other players. But again, a uh, lot more things like uh, understanding of the court, point construction, their uh, mental strength to handle uh, the tough situations, crucial times like game points, match points. I know if you uh, uh, heard uh, the latest uh, interview of uh, Dominic Thiem, Djokovic, uh, Nadal and Federer are planning to donate uh, money to the lower ranked players and Dominic Thiem said he doesn't want to do it because uh, he thinks uh, the lower ranked players don't work as hard as them. Yeah, so probably there you can understand the difference between the top 20 players and uh, the rest of the players. Probably they are not working as hard as the top 20 players. So next question, we go to, can we get an accurate speed gun in the academy to measure service speeds? Frequent measuring will motivate advanced players to improve. Yeah, that's true. Uh, measuring the speed will definitely motivate the players to uh, serve harder and harder. Yeah, we, we, we will get a, a accurate speed gun. But again, uh, in my point of view, I think uh, speed is not the only factor to uh, uh, get a great surf. Uh, it is uh, accuracy and uh, consistency. So you should be able to surf consistently. You should be able to get more first surf percentage and also you should be able to serve accurately wherever you want to surf. So I think these two are uh, major factors than the speed. If you again see uh, why uh, Federer, Djokovic and Nadal are dominating the game. Probably it's not that their serve is like really hard, but then they are very accurate and they are very consistent. If you see their uh, percentage of uh, first serves falling in and uh, percentage of even second serves, very less double faults. Let's go to the third question. Some players like Novak and Murray interact with their teams during matches, especially when down in a match, while others like Federer turn inwards. Which approach is better? Mm. First of all, in uh, Grand Slam tournaments or any other uh, major uh, tournaments, talking to the coaches is not allowed during a match. Um, I recently came to know that in qualifying rounds, they do allow uh, interaction with the coaches, even in the Grand Slams, but uh, in the main draw matches, and other uh, international tournaments, they don't allow players to interact with the players. So, in uh, Spain also, uh, during uh, national tournaments, uh, the coaches do interact with players. I think that helps players to understand the game, understand the opponent. And because since uh, junior tournaments are uh, for learning, it does help. In India, we don't have that system. Uh, hopefully, I think if ITA comes up with that, it will be really useful for the players to grow. Next question. How does one really prepare for a four or five hour match? Practice matches would really go that long. One difference between top 20 and others seem to be the ability to last. How does one really prepare for a four and four or five hour match practice matches? Uh, that's exactly why I tell kids to play more and more tournaments. If you see even uh, IDA tournaments, what they play, um, they have multiple matches. They have uh, uh, multiple three set of matches sometimes. They have uh, two singles, one double sometimes. So they do get uh, uh, to play longer hours and then that will uh, build their stamina for uh, longer matches and even the aptitude to play longer matches. And even in practice sessions, 
uh, though we have shorter formats they are staying on, in the court for longer hours though they are playing against different players they are playing different formats but still they are playing longer time uh, and we do plan sessions accordingly so that they get um, that kind of exposure so next question how many hours of fitness is ideal for our kids what are the major aspects in fitness that they should be focusing on um fitness one thing is uh, it's not that the fitness what they do off the court is only the fitness because uh, when they are playing also they are uh, doing uh, equal amount of fitness uh, which is uh, which is called a court fitness so off the court yeah they have to do they have to improve their uh, flexibility their agility and uh, certain uh, uh, channelized movements so uh, number of hours it depends on uh, the age of the kid if the kid is uh, um, between 5 to 10 years old i think half an hour to 45 minutes of fitness of the court is fine and then one or two hours of tennis on the court but if they are above uh, 10 and already are getting into playing tournaments um one to two hours of fitness and then uh, four to six hours of uh, playing tennis i think is uh, preferable per day people always talk about quality versus quantity what do you think how many hours of tennis they should play both are essential quality of the game is uh, equally important to the quantity of uh, number of hours they are playing on the court because uh, uh, the quantity will help them hit more number of balls and so their hand eye coordination will improve their uh, um, focus will improve and uh, quality of course uh, as the world itself suggests that uh, you need to have quality when you are doing your training you need to be uh, specific because um, you shouldn't waste too many hours on the court you should try to uh, stick to specifics especially when, when you're a tournament uh, playing kid and when i say quality doesn't mean that uh, you just play for 1 uh, hour 2 hours and then uh, go home the it has to be a certain number of hours and uh, so quantity and quality both are required to achieve uh, maximum potential so the next question how does diet and nutrition help the kids how much of diet conscious should they be how much diet does contribute in being successful top 20 players typical diet hmm very good question and i think uh, diet and nutrition are very important for any athlete um like as you uh, put the right fuel to the car like petrol for the petrol engine and diesel for the diesel engine and not kerosene you have to put uh, right uh, fuel to your body for it to function well as indians we have our own way of uh, eating food we have our own uh, um you know diet what we uh, have been consuming throughout the centuries um europeans they have their own style and uh, americans they have their own style so it all depends on what you've been eating and you just have to make a little bit of uh, fine tuning there since uh, we already have a lot of carbohydrates in our diet uh and um, very less protein um we have to uh, increase the protein intake in our diet if you're a non vegetarian eat uh, lean meat like chicken and uh, fish if you're a vegetarian add uh, more pulses grains uh, soya and if if you're drinking milk then that's also a very good source of uh, protein paneer cheese and all that but i think right now you shouldn't worry too much about uh, a systematic planned diet let the kids 
enjoy eating whatever is available and um, everything um, what uh, they have access to uh, as long as it's uh, not junk not too fried or and, uh, not too much of sugar let's go to the next question now tactical tennis discuss different patterns and how to execute them with correct shot selection whiteboard session would be better we can do this but um, let's do this in a different video because uh, there are so many things to elaborate and explain so the next question is um, how to control the shot when running towards the net and finishing around the service box it lands just outside the baseline it's tricky on hard courts as one can't slide it's a really really good question uh, i see a lot of my students uh, uh, going wrong here if you have not understood the question uh, when your opponent hits a drop shot or a short ball what how 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 do you go and hit it most of the time i've seen my students uh, miss these shots uh, because they run right behind the ball so a uh, very important thing is to run next to the ball go around it so that you can meet the ball on your side and second thing is if you are not able to catch it above the net height if if the ball is uh, dropping below the net height then you need to add in a lot of toss spin and then you have to shorten your uh, follow through as much as possible uh, something called a windscreen wiper forehand um uh, so that you hit uh, enough toss spin for the ball to uh, go up and then dip in as quickly as possible short cross court is the most preferred shot if you can uh, do that again uh, because uh, cross court you get more uh, space and you get you create more angle so that you can get ready for the volley and uh, in the question he also asks uh, he says it just lands outside the baseline so that's what you have to hit with a lot of toss spin and with a shorter follow through so that the ball goes up and then lands uh, inside quickly you got to practice it uh it's tricky on hard courts as one can't slide these days uh, players do slide on hard courts not as comfortably as on uh, clay though if you see jokovic he does slide but yeah if you can't slide then uh, uh, again the best option is to slice it uh, put a drop shot back on it uh, that way you don't have to do much of a rotation and uh, uh, you'll be uh, more stable on the court and it's easier for you to recover how to judge okay next question how to judge and anticipate top spin balls what style of shot to adapt to return top spins so when a player hits a top spin what is a top spin when the ball is um, rotating outwards so generally what happens with the top spin is uh, it looks as if the ball is traveling slow uh, but because the ball has the outward spin the ball is going to hit the ground and then it's going to come fast at you so the trajectory of the ball is not uh, same as how a regular ball bounces it's going to go up with a little bit of a loop but then when it hits the ground it's going to shoot it's going to get get back its pace so with enough practice with number of times hitting the balls uh, uh, you will get used to it and also for a toss spin shot it's always better to do on the rise return uh, because um, that way you can counter the pace you can use the pace um sometimes if it is a high heavy top spin shot the ball will bounce higher and it it will uh, pull you back to the, too far away from the baseline so um if you can play the ball on the rise then you will uh, counter it well if you can uh, take nadal and federer as example in early stages uh, when uh, federer used to lose to nadal it's because of that heavy uh, high top spin shots especially to uh, federer's backhand and because federer uh, has a single hand backhand then later on he changed his style he started coming a lot more inside he started standing closer to the baseline to take the ball on the rise and that's why he started doing something called a saber also probably he practiced it a lot so he became so good at saber the sneak attack by federer 
what style of shot to adapt to return to spin yeah again yeah on the rise and to play on the rise obviously you'll have to take um, uh, early back swing because uh, the the ball becoming um, way quicker at you so you got to practice early back swing and then taking the ball on the rise i think these two things will help you uh, counter heavy toss spin shots and how to return fast serves with heavy toss spin that comes to your forehand generally service returns uh, are a bit flattish you can't really put that much toss spin on the ball because uh, yeah, and that too if it is a first serve return the pace is really high and uh, it, it it's very difficult for you to take a good back swing and then put a toss spin on the ball so uh, it's not uh, very convenient to be able to hit a heavy toss spin on a first serve it's it's better to take a shorter back swing and then just use the pace of the ball and do a good deep return and then probably start the point with a good heavy toss spin on the next shot if you see uh, how federer returns the service very simple he most of the times slices the returns Djokovic, Murray are the best returners. They take that shorter back swing and then they use the pace of the ball. But uh, Federer uh, uh, just puts the ball back. He tries to keep the percentage high of returning the serves back in the court. So you probably you can do that also. You can uh, put a little bit of a slice and then return it back. So next question: For a cross court shots, under what situations do we do return cross court or down the line? most of change direction down the line shots goes out returning cross court is less risky than changing direction but change of direction gives you the chance of taking points how to decide mm. this is a really 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 good question we come in these situations when we are uh, uh, playing matches when we are trying to construct the point so uh, changing the direction of the ball is always difficult so when your opponent is hit hit the ball um, uh, uh, across the court so easier to send it back in the same direction than uh, sending it uh, down the line um so uh, when uh, the when your opponent has hit the ball um, really hard and uh, deep then it's it's better to send it back uh, cross court only and then uh, uh, wait for a easier uh, ball which, where you can uh, uh, change the direction um, but um, if your opponent has it a down the line shot then it's easier to send the ball cross court because uh, cross court is a more natural uh, way of swinging the racket and then the court is wider and uh, you get natural toss spin on the shot so yeah cross court down the line is a bit difficult shot uh, but uh, down the line to cross court is uh, a easier shot generally a down the line shot is a tougher shot because court is small and and you don't get uh, natural swing when hitting a down the line shot so we go to the next question what kind of mental preparation one needs to do before a match first thing is uh, you need to uh, get yourself composed because uh, you are uh, stepping into a, a match where uh, you will be totally uh, isolated so you have to be uh, really in a good frame of mind so sitting in a quiet place i would help listening to some good music or whatever your taste is will help you to um, get out of all the anxieties and uh, all the fears and all the tension which is building up um in your mind and uh, yeah so i think that should uh, do the trick and of course when you are uh, doing your warm up also if you can listen to some music and if you uh, if you don't have uh, anything to listen to then uh, staying uh, uh, doing your warm up in a quieter place 
will uh, uh, prepare you mentally better to go on the court and uh, face your opponent singles and doubles game strategies for winning if possible to share so there are a lot of strategies um, which you'll have to do for winning a match both in singles and doubles um, again we'll cover this in uh, probably in a, uh, another video next question is what all precautions and care we as parents should take to make sure that kids last in tennis for the longest period parents first of all should make sure that they put less pressure on the kids not less no pressure on the kids when it comes to sports or anything for that matter the kid should uh, enjoy playing uh, tennis he should uh, he or she should uh, enjoy going to the academy parents should give all the freedom for the kids to relate to their coaches and uh, make sure uh, to not confuse the kid with uh, too much of information trust the coach try to have a friendly environment at home try to be uh, as close to your uh, um, son or daughter as possible so that uh, he or she can uh, share uh, their uh, experiences their emotions with you because uh, in sports generally they do go uh, um, they do get in uh, into a lot of stress they do get uh, uh, a lot emotional because of the matches they are playing because of the pure competition and uh, um, and all the other uh, uh, pressure they go through so be a friend more than a parent i think that's what that's the best word i can tell next question how does a junior player make successful transition to pro circuit hmm this was asked by one of uh, our students so i just thought i'll add this question here according to me there's no transition if you are uh, if you are too good for the junior circuit then you're automatically in the pro circuit so there's nothing like transition there's nothing like uh, the competition is really high in the pro circuit and um, you know and the competition is different from uh, junior and uh, pro it's just that you are uh, younger and you are making uh, a new uh, uh, you are taking a new uh, step but then if you are uh, if you are really good at competing in the higher level if you don't see much of a competition in junior level then i think that is the transition there's no uh, uh, special thing there if you are uh, not ready then i think you should uh, stick to uh, playing in the junior circuit to gain more experience to get more confident and to become better at it and then make a jump to pro circuit then you will be more comfortable you will be able to handle the pressure better because what's the point of going to the next level and then not able to perform it will only demotivate you you will feel that the competition is too high there then that's why most of them uh, think that there is a transition between a junior circuit and senior circuit because they do the jump even before they are ready so that's why they see the difference but otherwise if they are ready i think if you see nadal federer and all they when they were 16 17 they've um, they've started playing uh, uh, pro circuit nadal hasn't played uh, any junior grand slams uh, when he was junior he was playing the pro circuit he was playing the uh, men uh, men circuit grand slams and uh, yeah that's about it next one what is the importance of physical f- flexibility in tennis flexibility is one of the uh, essentials for any athlete if the muscle is flexi- flexible um, you will um, prevent uh, um, injuries your uh, range of motion will improve so being being flexible is very very important but again that's not the most important uh, thing in tennis um, timing 
hand eye coordination strength uh, racket head speed all these also play a vital role in uh, uh, tennis players uh, game but of course flexibility is also very important uh, i think uh, um, that's about it we got these many questions and uh, i tried my best to answer uh, keeping it as simple as possible but again uh, these are the basic questions what generally occur in uh, our minds if if we have to be uh, very specific uh, uh, with our answers then uh, it totally depends on a specific player and it's also easy for us to explain it on court in that situation so uh, yeah i think that's about it thanks for watching peace